G'day, g'day, Shedosaurus here. Uh, today I'm going to show you my method of creating tapered staves, uh, beveled and tapered, uh, to finish off making this drum I did some time ago. This is just the top part of a drum they call the goblet drum or the djembe. And uh, it's been sitting in the shed for too long. I've spilt oil on it and all sorts of things, but uh, it'll still come good. So... Uh, couple of things, uh, measurements I've got to do here. The way I am I got this particular measurement here, so this is the narrower side and it goes up, sort of widens out over there. Uh, this is the middle of the unit. This is where the ring sits that holds the rope. It just makes it centralizing it easier. But anyway, so what you got here is, uh, this is 114 millimeters diameter. Uh, I then take the thickness of the timber that I want to use, which in this case I'm using, uh, what would it be, 26.5 mil thick. So I've du doubled that and uh, added that to the 114. That gives me a total size of 167 mil, pretty much from that edge to that edge there. So uh, I'm going to show you the calculations I, I use of how to work things out. It's, there's no sine, cosine, stop sine, tangent, whatever rubbish. It's uh, it's uh, it's fairly easy. It's pretty much you just you just got to know that pi is 3.14 and a circle's 360 degrees. So yeah, we start off with the sizes. So 167. I'm doing 240 at the at the base. I'm going 320 high. That doesn't really factor in. To this at all at the moment so I've taken the 167 I need to get the circumference so it times that by pi which is 3.14 blah 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 but I'm only doing up to two decimal points that gives me this number that's the circumference then I've got the 240 mil circumference of that is 753.6 now to get the how wide your staves are going to be don't ever go over I call sort of 80 on a large drum the maximum and uh, sort of 70 on a smaller drum your maximum don't go larger than that because the the curvature it, it it's too many straight edges so you want it to be curved nicely once you round it off and not losing out on getting you know where the joins are going too thin so that I'll show you what I mean by that is there's your curve and then you go sort of like that you want to be more more gentle so that the, the shorter they are it's a little wet, the, the the better it'll be that uh, there's the curve and then you've got sort of one two three that sort of thing so that you've got strength in the in the shell itself uh, this one shell here that that's uh, started off at 22 mil thick just to give you an idea and it's about 21 on the thicker parts and going down to about 19 mil on the thinner parts but let's get back to this so for the 12 12 sides um it's 12 staves will give me 62 mil wide at the at the widest part uh and so that's fine so we've got 62 there we've done that 43.7 measurement for that uh you then subtract the two from each other gives 19.1 divide that by two you get the 9.55 that's your taper on each side so then to find out the angle we're going to be cutting things at there's 12 sides but all up there's 24 angles because there's an angle on every piece so you double the 12 sides to 24 you 360 divided by 24 this is going to give you 15 degrees so 15 degree bevel on that, 9.55 offset from the square or rectangular piece that you're going to start with. Uh, when I'm making the, uh, the template or the, the jig, I'll show you, here's an old jig of mine that I've already made in the past. Now this one had a 19 mil offset it was for 10 sides using 18 degrees um, now when you when you make these you're making these steps here 
and uh, that's going to I'll, I'll get more into that shortly but we're always on the first step I tend to make the first step 0.5 of a millimeter smaller than that so that'll be pretty much 9.05 we'll just call it 9 on that first step because that's your first off cut when you're cutting your, your piece of wood you're going to lay the fir first cut's going to go that this bottom part's going to sit on your fence and that's going to sit like that i'll reduce this that height there of the first one by 0 0.5 mil i just find it works better it just seems to give you a better end product of uh, uh, accuracy to the final size that you're after now remember you always got to cut slightly larger because uh well you don't have to if you're happy with just gluing it after you've cut it by all means you, you just cut to size uh, i'm going to be putting it on top of a uh, uh dressing it on the thickness uh, at that same angle so uh, i'll be leaving just a tiny bit more on on each side just to clean it up and uh, take any dags off so let's get to making the jig and I'll show you how I do that so here's another jig I made over here this one uh, uh, I've, I've sort of moved over to this style of making them rather than uh, one piece of wood you can always glue these on or just have it that you remove them off and you can redo them so the way I've done this one is you do your first cut this is just remember it, it doesn't matter how thick this is it can be thicker or thinner than your staves it's, it doesn't really matter the way we're doing this is so just make sure you've got a nice smooth edge because that's going to be running on your fence of your saw and uh, so the first cut I'll do I'll just leave a little bit of meat on it and I'll do the first cut just at any random size just leave a bit of meat there then move the the and you've got to really adjust this i mean you use a micrometer on this uh you then move the sword fence over and you cut your second one and in this stage we're going to be cutting 9.05 that's the first cut so then you cut that that one in so i've just i haven't gone right the way through with the blade on there i've stopped just short of it and then i've used the chisel and just cut that so that that's that's where I want to be with that I then take the off cut that I've had over here and I tilt the blade to 15 degrees now you've got to be accurate on that I mean it's not 100% but 99% would be good you don't have to, I mean don't be too fancy you can you can be a bit dodgy and it's not really gonna hurt but it's gonna change your measurement so you then do, do a rough cut first you know not don't go straight into using your best timber find out what you've got to shave off where you know if you shave off the stave gets bigger if you take this piece out and put a larger piece in or put a shim in here that that's going to make it larger so but the way you work is that 9.5 over there that's the size of this point let me get something finer to point with that's the that's nine point oh that's nine point oh five that's the nine point five measurement there not this side here you, you you've got to measure it because when you're on your second cut your piece that you're cutting is going to be sitting up on there down like that sort of thing and so you it's it's this long measurement that's the outside measurement that you want so that's why we're using this part here is you don't worry about this just make that 15 degrees I then use the opposite the off cut of that piece and I just stick that on the top just bear in mind with these the high part must always go on the right hand side that's uh, it because then when that you do that cut it'll put this part here at the bottom that goes on the table and so it doesn't matter how thin your jig is that point that 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 uh, long points always going to be in the same position so uh, let's start a cut first. So with this one, I'm, I'm just using a little bit of maple and uh, we're gonna go and do that first cut, just probably about that deep there and go part way. And then I'm gonna do the second cut. You can do them the other way around, doesn't matter. And uh, I'll show you each cut as I go through. Okay, so that's the first cut there. 
nothing flash, nothing fancy about that. Yeah, rough is good. We're going to do the second cut now. In this case, the thickness of the long section was 50.34. I've added the 9.05 onto that and I've come to 59.4. Accuracy is your friend here. Now we're going to do the angled part. So that gets cut separately and I generally just screw or glue it on top there. There you go. So we've got that angle piece cut now. So this is where the measurement's taken from. Don't worry about that measurement. And then it's going to go high side to there. And then on top of that, I'm going to take an off cut from that same piece. And I'm going to glue that to there. So you can leave however big a step you want to leave that. That's up to you. This is the way I do it. So. Yeah, you got to observe all your usual safety rules, whatever else. That that's that's your business. This is mine. Well, it's not a business, but this is how I do it. So, and uh, that's the finished product that I'm after. So I'm going to glue that up, and we'll come back. First cut on the first step. Second cut is done by flipping the jig over first, flipping the timber over, and flip the timber over again. And then that'll fit nicely on that stepped point. Do the second cut. It's a bit uh, narrow on my timber there. I'm gonna just adjust. With the second cut, I just keep running it through bit by bit, keep measuring, measuring until you're getting close. So once I've uh, finished the cutting, I've then measured it. Uh, I've, this is the crucial side that I was measuring to. Uh, this one's actually been cut two size. I haven't cut this one larger because this, these are just my trial ones. So this is 43.7, but this has given me 63.7 and I was after 62.8. So it's a one mil discrepancy, which says to me that I could in, in essence take that down by another half a mil uh, I don't think it's necessary it's that close I don't think I'm gonna bother with it so I'm just gonna do now a test run and uh, knock up now these are thinner so the ones I'll be doing are thicker these are 19 mil I think uh, I'll, I'll knock up 12 of these and then we'll do a mock-up on them and see how they fit When it's cut, just uh, that was just to show you how quick you can actually do these. Um, you'll notice that there's just a tiny bit that didn't get cut there. I mean, it's it's not very much. When you by the time you've added your glue and when you curve the unit, that that part gets taken out in any way. So don't worry about that if you've got just a tiny little flat spot in some of them. That's fine. If you've got wider boards, you don't have to bother cutting them to size. If you reckon you can get two out of that, and you know what they say, fools reckon smart people know, you'd probably measure it and then you'd know. Uh, 
don't don't bother about cutting them down the center and stuff like that you can quite happily cut two out of one I'll show you how to do that Go back to your square edge. Don't don't muck around with that. You'll end up with skew ends because that's already been. That way, get two out of the one. And if you have a look, by the fluff of the wood, the wood's a bit damp, is uh, getting some pretty good close joins there. So just out of interest, uh, the sizes we're going for up the top was 167. I've got 164 there, so that's pretty bloody close. Uh, and the other side, 240, and I was shooting for 240, go figure, eh? So, uh, pretty happy with that. I'll, um, and I'll start uh, cutting up some of my fancier timber and getting it ready for the, um, for the next one. Looking at the fit from the end, see a little bit of a gap there and a little bit of a gap there. I can just push my nail in that one. That one can't get the nail into that one. You can. It's a pretty good fit. What I'm going to do is I'll just take one out and uh, plane it, but I first want to check sizes. So sizes come up at 239 that's one mil off 163 from 162 required so can't complain about that really happy with that uh, result so I'm just going to change the angle on one of them uh, maybe on both sides of it and that'll uh, that'll bring the whole thing back together so once your glue is dried, whether you've got a lathe and you want to put on a lathe or something, uh, I, I prefer doing them by hand because uh, you tend to get a uh, more even finish. Whereas with a lathe, you know, it's only got to be slightly out of round and uh, you're going to have all sorts of issues. It's, it's um, going to make some walls slightly thinner than others or 
so forth, whereas doing it like this, there's no such thing as a perfectly round drum and yeah, yeah, of course there is. How fancy do you want to get? And it's not necessary at all. It's not going to make any difference to the sound. It's uh, what does make a difference to the sound is the ring of the shell. So if uh, yeah, this shell's still fairly thick, so it's not going to be that good a sound, but. got a good good solid sound to it if there was each each of these pieces by the way because this is all recycled timber nail holes and everything else in it each of these pieces I've actually dropped on a hard hard metal surface and to to listen I want to hear a little bit of a a, a tune from each one if I'm not getting a tune it means there's a crack in the timber and actually I did find a couple that had cracks in I had to redo them um and so that's one of the ones i redid uh and i think the one next to it those two because it, the sound of the other pieces it wasn't it just wasn't right and when i then started having a closer look and pulling straight stressing the wood i then was able to see that there was uh there was some cracks in there and that's not what you want it, it that can ruin the sound of a, of a good drum just some small hairline cracks and stuff so I'll, I'll continue this and uh, I'll come back when it's closer to done so there's a rough enough finish for now sanding and stuff comes later I do actually have a machine that I made that you can put this on and uh, it takes all of about oh, three minutes to uh, finish the outside perfect uh, very light sand after that um, but uh, I haven't got that set up it's just, it just takes up too much space so I'll set it up another time and I'll do a video on that uh, by itself next I'm gonna do is I'm gonna level these edges off and uh, why I'm gonna do that is with a electric planer um, I'll set up the camera and uh, I'll show you how I do it the the trick is is to keep your blade following that you can't have your blade running off or coming on you're keeping the, the planer on and you're just turning it like that but with the blade section always facing into it as it goes around you'll see what I mean That pretty much gives a 100% flat surface and not a bad finish on it either I'll do the top it's a bit more uh, finicky because it's a smaller ring but it's not that hard to do either <laughs> Once again, beautiful, smooth, flat surface, and uh, I'll, I'll I usually uh, get rid of some of this. I just round it up a little bit, to, and uh, then it'll be ready for gluing. So you can see how flat that is as a cast iron metal surface. Doesn't wobble at all. Both sides, hundred percent flat. Yeah, you can muck around with all sorts of other routed jigs and rubbish. And it, this just does it so fast. It, it's uh, this way. 
and as far as accuracy goes uh, looking down the throat there you can see how my sizes came out in the end uh, the very accurate method for making these things the, uh, the way I do the final smoothing off is uh, just with the got the, the drum in a V groove down the bottom there and uh, just just keep it moving and it'll give a really I mean that's you cannot feel any bumps there at all anymore that's uh, that's beautiful so I'm just gonna finish it off with something a bit finer now time to glue so for this part I'm going to uh, just mix up some two-part epoxy and I'm just going to sit the drum on there loose by itself it'll um, dry nicely epoxy gains a lot of strength it's, it's got to be there you can't clamp the joint so hard that it, you push it all out and uh, any glue that I've got left, I'll uh, I just use to fill some holes. Might throw some graphite powder with it to blacken it up a bit. Doesn't really matter. It'll it dries fairly light. The stuff. So. This is a, a structural uh, glue, so it's it's got a fairly strong rating. So once that glue is dried, I'll then get in there, drill through that lip at the bottom and uh, put at least uh, four stainless steel long screws into, uh, into that base as well, which will give it a lot more strength. In the past, I've used that scrim tape, which is that fiber, woven, woven fiber um, uh, fiberglass, and I've done a line of that in there. but uh, thus far, all any of the ones I've made, you can you can stand on them. They don't break at that collar. I don't think it's necessary. My method of how I apply beeswax to timber uh, to get a good even finish. Uh, so firstly, I'm I'm mixing the uh, the beeswax. I just break it up into pieces and I just throw it in a container with uh, gum turps. You got to leave it for about a week or so. You give it a bit of a stir. Uh, might have to add more gum turps just keep going until you get a nice pasty sort of consistency you can see sort of what I'm getting at over here and uh, so then I, I then apply that but that by itself you can see it it absorbs in straight away because there's an instant color change in the timber but that in itself to me isn't isn't enough it's um, yes I could add more of the gum turps and thin it down further so that it soaks in better um, but uh, you, you're not sure what sort of a finish you get then because you're you're waiting for the gum turps to evaporate before you can see what sort of finish that you actually get but I then give it a hit with a heat gun and you keep going you get that beeswax to a melted point and it'll go fairly quick now this is the heat gun this is my method. I, I tend to have the heat gun on fairly, fairly heavy, and uh, as you can see, it's beautiful smell coming off this, by the way. So, and then so once it's given it an initial melting, I then go a bit slower. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see just over there that you get. It almost looks like dry patches it's where it's really soaked in far because that the, the the heat just really gets that wax to a point where it soaks soaks in fairly deep and pretty much disappears um, as you can see it's sort of looking dry over here now if you go over it again it's sort of but it, it just goes back to dry as soon as you move off and uh, keep keep that up and once I've done that, I'll then, then come back and with 
just a, a buffing mop on a drill, I'll, uh, I'll come in and buff that. I don't know if you can see what that finish is like, but that's a semi-gloss low sheen kind of finish there. And there's no stickiness left from the beeswax or anything like that. It's, it's really soaked in nicely. And I find that this tends to last a hell of a lot longer uh, than your, your standard, you know, if you're just applying and uh, wiping your excess off sort of thing. This this and and this is nice and hot now and I know that that beeswax is gone it's penetrated in nice and deep that uh, for years to come this this finish seems to last whereas a surface application without the heat and so forth tends to have to be always reapplied and reapplied and reapplied so uh, that's my method of doing it anyway I'll switch off I'm going to continue I'll show you the finished product Beautiful. Don't do the inside. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. The finished product. Got some uh have some good uh, good bass just you can hear the the uh, ring sounds true there's no cracks in there so um, came up beautifully 